great to hear what they're cooking up with the power platform. I'm sure we're going to hear an awful lot more about that in the next hour because we've got Donna Sarkar, who actually leads an advocacy team specifically for Power Platform, joining us also with Seth Juarez to be able to take over some of the hosting duties that's coming up here at Microsoft Tonight in the studios. They're going to be coming up in just a few minutes. But before we get to that, we're going to be jumping into this next section that I love to be able to talk with uh, and specifically talk with Mark Rasinovich, the CTO of Microsoft Azure and also Technical Fellow, joining me from his secret bunker. Hey, Mark, how's it going? <laughs> hey, Rick, it's going well. How are you? Not too bad, not too bad at all. Um, this is kind of a treat because, well, first of all, I do have to, to call back to the fall ignite uh, when we had a little bit of trouble with the networking inside of your secret bunker where you went wireless <laughs> as opposed to wired. I'm glad to see that you're yeah. wired up this time. Yep, thanks for your help on setting that up for me. <laughs> nope, no problem. But uh, you know, specifically, I was wondering if you could just kind of do a quick little recap around what is specifically your role as the CTO of Azure, uh, and you still do some technical fellow pieces in there as well. Yeah, well, so uh, the CTO role was an individual contributor role when I started at, in that role, but in the subsequent years, it's grown into a, an office of the CTO, and I have four teams underneath me. One of them is the open source ecosystem team, which focuses on open source partnerships, as well as open source guidance for open source usage and contributions inside of the company. I've got another team which is focused on Azure architecture, so standardizing at architectural best practices and design across the platform. Mm -hmm. I've got a third team, which is an incubations team, which incubates various projects uh, that are kind of cross-cutting in Azure. Uh, one of them that I think we'll talk about in this video is Dapper, which mm -hmm. came out of that team. And then my fourth team is a team that's uh, got a code name Singularity, which is focused on building AI supercomputer infrastructure as a service. Awesome stuff. And you know, my, my invitation is still open if you happen to have any open head count or something like that. I've got a team of people that would love to come and be able to work with you down in that particular CTO office. Um, the, the session that we're going to be talking about kind of right now is, is a bit of a mishmash of a, just the summaries and highlights of the really cool stuff that you have in your session that's available on, on demand and on pre-record, which is known as Inside the Azure Data Center Architecture. Uh, and I'm curious, like, do you, can you give me a little bit of background on, because you've been doing these for a while, right? Like, who came up with the original yeah. idea? Well, I'd been, when I was in Windows, I was doing Windows internals talks at, at TechEd at the time and other conferences that always were well received. And when I switched over to Azure, I started to give talks that went underneath the hood of Azure architecture. And uh, a few years into that, I decided to just uh, rename it Inside Azure Data Center Architecture. And mm -hmm. so I started doing that talk in like 2015. And like the Windows internals talk, like the Case Then Explained talks, every version of it, every instance of it is new in terms of the demos that it covers, in terms of the technology that I talk about, keeping up with what's going on the platform and giving people a view into what's coming. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to being able to see that one there. I did get a sneak peek at it earlier, so I was able to take some uh, notes to ask you some questions that are in there. And I hear that you might be able to do a bit of a uh, demo as well, but I will direct people to your Twitter feed as an example for at sign Mark um, He just recently tweeted out a short teaser video uh, to an AKA link to be able to go off and to see a quick little teaser of that, about that particular session if you wanted to check that one out yourself online. But um, the first thing I want to talk to you about, because you did break the session down into uh, six different sections. And that particular session, seven. sorry, seven. seven. Did, did I count yeah. that wrong? Hang on a second, one, two, yeah, three, you, four. Yeah, I mean, traditionally it's been six. We had right. a, a seventh one this time. Okay, well, it's, uh, let's, let's stay on top of that one there. But the, the thing that you mentioned when we did our bit of a prep was the fact that there's like 12 demos in this one. Is that, uh, is that correct? Yeah, uh, that's correct. 12, I think, is the record. Uh, it might tie the record, but it's up there in terms of number of demos. So uh, just a demo palooza type of uh, presentation, which people always like seeing the demos rather than just hearing about the technology, but actually seeing it in action. Right, so in a little bit, I'm gonna actually put you on the spot and see if you can actually recreate one of those demos coming up here in just a bit. But the, the very first section that we talked about in the particular session was talking about specifically our data centers. Uh, and I'm happy to, to, to um, mention that you refer to the fact that uh, we have these uh, availability zones or AZs or AZs if you're American, mm -hmm. I guess. Uh, and uh, 
you're now going to be announced uh, in your session. Well, I probably shouldn't say that. You should probably make that announcement. What's going on with, uh, with availability zones uh, inside of Azure in this calendar year? Yeah, well, so we've been working on availability zones for many years. It's uh, There's a lot of complexity that goes into the design of the hardware, the data center infrastructure connecting uh, region together, as well as the software design that spans availability zones, spans these different discrete data centers that are physically isolated from one another, and the software logically isolates them from one another as well. On that journey this year is a kind of a breakthrough year because we're committed to now for every new region that goes live, it will have availability zones. And by the end of the year, calendar year, we'll also have all of our foundational and mainstream services will support availability zones. Mm -hmm. Now, for those that are new to Azure or new to the concept of availability zones, can you kind of give us a little bit of a breakdown, the difference between a region and the difference between availability zones and how they kind of fit in to like uh, infrastructure design? Yeah, well, so a region, it just describes a, a location where mm -hmm. you're going to have Azure services. And in the early days of Azure, a region meant when it started just a single data center, then it grew to multiple data centers within the region. But we've had then transition to an architecture which is we called availability zones uh, with the industry term for it as well that describes discrete physical data centers or data center or data centers in a configuration that provides a regional service capabilities so for example if I you go to the region you access service capabilities underneath that region now are these discrete availability zones where you can have the zonal services like virtual machines that you pin to a particular region. And the fact that you can now have these fundamental building blocks that can go into AZs allows you to build these higher level services on top that actually mask problems with availability zones, mask in the in the in those data centers. For example, if there's a, a fire or a flood in a data center in AZ1, it doesn't affect anything in AZ2 or 3 because they're completely physically isolated from network power cooling as well as physical structure. Mm -hmm. And so the service on top then can mask that and provide services at the regional level that are able to be withstand and uh, mask these kinds of availability zone scoped failures. Okay, so basically when you're off and designing your infrastructure for your application or the individual service you want to use, if it's availability zone aware, you simply can target this area and it will go off and do the magic of using that availability zone from its infrastructure. That's awesome. but. Also in the data center section, you made a big section and talking about our sustainability efforts. Um, again, I don't want to give away everything inside, this, inside the session as a whole, but I'm curious from what you know of our stuff that we've been doing on the sustainability side, which is like the one thing that's, that kind of stands out for you from those big numbers that were on those, the, the walls behind you. Do you have anything that kind of sticks out for you? Of interest. Well, I think it's our commitment to, like one of them, I think the key one is our commitment to be 100% renewable by the year 2025. Right. Uh, but that kind of represents a huge chunk of the initiative. But then we also have, and I'll talk about, I talk about this in the session as well, is the efforts to actually undo climate change um, through pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. And we've got a couple projects underway that I talk about with partnerships with governments as well as companies that uh, we've, in fact, one of them that we invested in to help pull carbon out of the atmosphere and store it safely underwater or in concrete. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that makes sense. Yes, I remember that particular section. It was it was quite impressive. The 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 ability to go through and to draw some energy and then take the carbon and then put it back in again inside that same spot was was actually yeah. really really cool. Um, from uh, the next section that you talked about for transitioning out of that one there from the data centers was specifically around the infrastructure, the intelligent infrastructure that was being used to be able to power our architecture of our data centers. Uh, and you mentioned two different things. You had talked about the uh, resource central, being able to go through and manage the current uh, in environment and how things work inside of Azure. And then something new that was the project, Nar I'm probably gonna say this one wrong, Naria, is that correct? That's so, correct. And so, At least that's the way I, I pronounce it too. So, okay, well, yes. if, if you pronounce it that way, then it's got to be the right way to be able to pronounce it. Um, that one there is not about the actual current and functioning. That one's about predictability for what's going on. Um, can, you, can you kind of elaborate an example of where the, the predictability piece kind of comes into play with how someone would be interacting with Azure? Yeah, well, so you're actually referring to that seventh section that I added this time around, intelligent infrastructure, which goes into AI ops and the way that we apply it. Uh, across a bunch of different ways, uh, including what you're just talking about now, which is intelligent resource allocation as part of Resource Central. So mm -hmm. how do we 
play spot priced VMs onto servers with the least probability that they'll get evicted with an on-demand instance that might show up in the near future. Uh, because we want to make those spot instances last as long as they can without evictions. Mm -hmm. But what you're talking about is another extension of that same using ML and, and the models to predict uh, what's going to be coming, what virtual machines are going to be deployed based off of historic patterns. And that is looking at uh, failure predictions. So looking at the signals coming off of a server, uh, like the disks, telemetry, the uh, correctable memory errors to predict when a server is going to fail and to be able to then live migrate or pull, uh, move a VM through something we call service healing, which may, might mean shutting down the virtual machine and, and restarting it on another server that's healthy. And also avoiding placing addition, newly arriving VMs on top mm. of that server that is imminently going to fail. Got it. Okay, so now I've got now I found the missing section, and that makes that one sense too. Yeah, uh, and where it actually goes in for the AI ops piece. That's awesome. Um, you've uh, I kind of talked about networking at the beginning of this with your wireless and now wired environment now, but uh, from a networking solution inside of our data centers, um, you went through and actually talked about going from the individual wiring the capabilities inside of the rack, moving towards the data center level. Again, we already talked about the availability zones and then the WAN and the last mile is kind of how it progresses. But then you introduced something really cool and you, you can't do mm -hmm. a demo of this one right now, I'm pretty sure, unless you have some capabilities that I'm not aware of, but but you mentioned something like subnets in space. Is that correct? Yep. Is that What's the proper term That's for right. this one? Uh, uh, well, it's uh, Azure Orbital is the yes. program. And this is uh, Azure support for, it's another way to describe it as ground station as a service. And it's okay. support for satellite communications into Azure data centers um, with two kinds of modes that we support. One is space to earth kind of uh, satellite downlinks. So if you've got observational satellites that are taking pictures, for example, of the planet's surface to look mm -hmm. for climate change, uh, that data needs to be downloaded to, and you ideally want to download it to some place where you can go analyze the data. And that great place for that is in Azure Data Center. So if you've got a, a satellite ground station, you can schedule these downloads mm -hmm. from those satellites uh, to automatically go capture that data as the satellite's passing over the, the ground station. And then the second one, which is the one that I demo, which is so cool, is for communications. And this is what you might think of satellites being useful for is on the edge in remote locations, being able to send data up through the satellite into an Azure data center. So this is, might be some IoT edge platform where you have data that you need to go analyze in the cloud, but you don't have a wired connection in that location. Mm -hmm. Now with uh, our work um, through the acquisition of Affirm Networks, which provides local LTE and 5G capability, you can connect that local network, which would be a phone-based network into Azure subnet uh, through its connection to Azure. And so uh, what I show in the, in the um, demo is going and surfing a Azure blob storage account that's locked down to a particular VNet off of my iPhone that is sitting there connected to an affirmed LTE network um, in, in the uh, demo uh, room in the session room and being able to surf the, uh, and browse that blob, uh, despite the fact that I'm not connected to the subnet via any wired means. Right, and that that literally is like one of the one of the top twelves for of mine that I saw from that particular uh, session that you did yeah. there for sure. Now another one of the top demos, and this is where I'm going to ask potentially if you could have a chance to be able to show us this one here, just because I love this as a as a guy that's been racking and stacking servers in my previous life before joining Microsoft and working inside of Azure and working with you and with other teams. Um, I was always big on individual large VMs and large capabilities, and in the fall we talked about the Mega Godzilla beast or it's the hyper super large, I forget the naming convention yeah. what it was, but but uh, you actually showed us the, the evolution of machines and the sheer sizes because we're looking at trying to run these big, huge workloads for memory resident databases like SAP HANA. Um, do you have access to one of those machines right now just to kind of give us a quick I, little reboot of that one? I, I do, in fact, have access to one. And would you like to take a look at it? It'd, it'd be great if you could, yeah. All right, yeah, let's switch over to it here. Uh, so, can you see my screen here? Yeah, yeah I, you I can. So there's there's Task Manager on the Mega Godzilla Beast, and you can see uh, down here 420 virtual processors. Mm -hmm. If I switch to the memory view, you can see that it's got a whole lot of RAM available, uh, 22 terabytes of RAM. Just a little bit. 
Yeah, but um, you know that's kind of fun um, to take a look at. But it can do things like run Notepad really fast. <laughs> that's the fastest you ever saw a Notepad launch. It runs Minesweeper really fast as well. Nice. Um, but then uh, some of the things, and I've tweeted about this, is showing it doing things like uh, playing Tetris or or Breakout. Um, but one of the things that I can do for you here live is actually we can take a bitmap. And this is a, a bitmap of the Dapper logo. Okay. Here. Yeah. And uh, I, I wrote a little program that will take a bitmap. Actually, let me save this in the right format. Oops, I forgot to resize. Let me resize this to 20 to fit on Task Manager. It, there's only so many processors and hyper threads that we have to be able to represent pixels, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah. And here we go, saving it. There we go. And here's the, here's the program I wrote. And if you take a look at this launch bitmap threads, mm -hmm. this is um, you take an existing program that might be uh, emitting something into an array where each entry in the array represents a particular CPU in the bitmap. This is the code that launches the threads, one per each core, using processor affinity right here mm -hmm. to lock a thread to a particular core. So this will then spin up on this machine 420 threads, one on each core. And each of those threads sits in this little loop right here, reading on a, a value out of an array, the CPU pixels array, to determine whether it should be burning CPU or not and what rate it should be burning it at. Right. So if it's set to full, it'll just sit there basically in a, a tight loop going to 100% CPU. If it's to medium, it'll sleep for uh, periodically to mm -hmm. consume only 50% of the CPU. And uh, I've got it here set up so that it's going to read this bitmap that I just created and display it on Task Manager. Uh, <laughs> see, to me, this is just absolutely awesome pixel art coming past on yeah. one of the largest virtual machine hosts that uh, we have running inside of uh, Azure right now to be able to go off and do that. And I, I also saw over the holidays, you had done them also for, uh, I believe, Breakout um, game and Actually, uh, some other ones too. Breakout, Breakout is new. I haven't shown that one. It's in the, the data center architecture talk. It, uh, I did. I showed Tetris. Oh, okay, okay. On, there. but Breakout is new. I thought I'd save that for the video. Nice. Well, again, those ones are going to be inside the uh, inside Azure Data Center architecture session. It's available on demand. Uh, that's coming up. Um, I, now, you you brought up the the Dapper logo, and you're obviously wearing a Dapper shirt, and that was inside of a particular section um, that was specifically about inside compute. And I thought I'd give you just a moment to kind of explain for us folks that aren't aware of what the open source project of Dapper is uh, and how it can be applied and what it can be used for. Yeah, well, so Dapper came out of it, the kind of learnings that we had around Azure Functions and actor models and service fabric and what looking at the, uh, how popular Orleans is as an actor platform, recognizing that enterprise devs want to just get their job done. And, and functions as a service is a great vehicle for just getting your job done. You just write a little piece of code that is your business logic and the platform takes care of invoking it based off of the triggers you define. And with Azure Functions, it's got this unique uh, capability called bindings where integrations with other services like Azure Storage also are done by the platform itself. So you don't have to worry about in your code, connecting to the storage account, authenticating, retrying, pulling in the SDK, that the that's all encapsulated in these bindings. Okay. So completely abstracting that from you. So the Dapper platform really builds on top of that, that those fundamental concepts of triggers and bindings, but does so in a way that doesn't require you to leverage ever, any SDK by delivering its capabilities through a sidecar. A sidecar being something that in the container world, you deploy a container that has the Dapper runtime in it next to your app, mm -hmm. and then just talk through a local HTTP endpoint to the Dapper runtime and say, hey, go do this for me, go do that for me, go uh, or call me when there's an event that fires or uh, a, a message shows up in my Kafka uh, message queue, mm -hmm. go call my code, just like an Azure function would. but 
Dapper is completely and opinionated. So you can do functions as a service on top of it. You can do actors on, on top of it. You can take an existing piece of code and say, I just want to use its state management abstraction. So I want to save some state into state store through the Dapper state store abstraction. But using component bindings underneath it, you can take that same piece of code, run it on Azure, take it on prem, and run it on your own infrastructure. Even if you've got a multi, if you've got a multi-cloud solution, even run it on another cloud platform and leverage the native state stores like Cosmos DB and Azure, or maybe Redis on premises, without having to touch the code at all. Oh, okay. So it gives you this portability, lets you focus on your your business task. And it's consumable a la carte. So you can buy fully into Dapper or you can just use one of its building block capabilities and it's got a, a full rich platform of these. Huge community that's built up around it. And the exciting thing is, and why I'm, I've been emphasizing it so much in the talk and here is that we just hit the 1.0 milestone, uh, basically saying this is now ready for production. In fact, mm -hmm. we've got multiple customers that are using it in production. And so, if you're interested in taking advantage of it and you've been worried, like, I want to wait and see what happens to it, it is now ready to go. Awesome. Now, are you, you're able to go in and start to use, I believe the term you used was to, is, I don't know if this is the right one or not, to dapperize an app. Uh, yeah. Is that, that's the whole yeah. concept? That's right. Dapperizing an app just means integrating with the dapper runtime. In fact, m most of the time, and I show this in the demo in the data center talk, is when you dapperize an app, you actually remove code from the app. Mm -hmm. So if you had the, that app that was inter, integrated directly with Cosmos DB, for example, and you wanted to dapperize it and say, I want to abstract it so now the code, it can be portable and I don't have to pull in the Cosmos DB SDK into my code, you dapperize it by just moving this uh, to use the dapper state store. Now the Cosmos DB code is in the binding and the authentication uh, all of the and the SDK usage and mm -hmm. your code is independent of that now and then becomes portable. Awesome. Um, we just got about three minutes or so left just to give you a little bit of a heads up, but so I do want to cover off that last section that we didn't get a chance to talk about yet. Uh, is something near and dear to my heart, the Azure Resource Manager. Uh, and uh, you were talking specifically around Project Bicep. Um, can you give us a little bit of a background on what Project Bicep is and how it hits and works for the IT Pro audience, the technical audience that's out there? Yeah, well, so one one of the things we saw um, with Azure Resource Manager and the JSON uh, schema for both calling the APIs as well as de defining templates is that it's incredibly verbose. It's got a lot of redundant kind of gestures in it. So, mm -hmm. and it's and it that leads to an air of complexity. And so many enterprise customers, as they were building out templates, which are a fantastic, powerful capability of Azure Resource Manager, they quickly get lost in the complexity of very long templates and and all of the verbosity uh, of it. And so to help uh, improve the experience around Azure Resource Manager templates, we added things like Visual Studio Code and, and uh, extensions that include things like IntelliSense, right. but that only get, got us so far. And so we decided to rethink the whole thing. Maybe there's another approach to this. Uh, looked at using maybe, hey, how about if we just had a, a programming language approach to Azure Resource Manager? We wanted to maintain the declarative aspect of it, and so we decided we wanted to create a brand new language, a DSL, domain-specific language for it, enlisted Anders Heilsberg to serve as a consultant for it and came mm -hmm. up with that, uh, the BICEP language. So the BICEP language lets you write ARM APIs calls as well as ARM templates in a very succinct, very natural programmatic way mm -hmm. while yet preserving the declarative nature and providing 100% fidelity with Azure JSON schema. So basically you can take a BICEP file and transpile it down to ARM G JSON, or you can go the reverse way, take an ARM JSON template, transpile it back to BICEP. And now with this 1.3 uh, release we've got this week, it's ready for production. And you can now hand BICEP files directly to the Azure CLI to deploy in Azure. And we've ha had tremendous customer uh, excitement about this. So I think it's one of the hottest uh, things in the compute space in terms of the reaction that we're seeing from so many people really saying this is going to change the way that they approach Azure Resource Manager and templates. 
Yes, absolutely, definitely. I love the fact that you call that one out here and there's our quick little chat, the concept of being able to go through and create and, and, and make new JSON templates, but then also decompile and make them turn into the, um, the bicep language to be able to go off and to analyze and work with them too. Fantastic stuff there. Again, there is lots more stuff inside of here. We've only just scratched the surface in this short interview. Uh, it is a, a phenomenal session uh, inside Azure Data Center architecture. You even go through and talk about GPUs, cooling, uh, different phases, is quantum stuff. There's just so much more to unpack inside of there, plus another easily 11-ish more demos to be able to go off and talk about. But I've taken up enough of your time, Mark. Thank you so much for joining us here uh, at Microsoft tonight. Really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Rick.